I'm Dave McAllister. I'm notorious for wandering around the stage a little bit. And to add three other things, I work for a company called Nginx. Some of y'all may have heard of Nginx, um, where the, uh, we serve something like 438 million websites a day. Uh, we have a grand total right now of 66 open source projects. Um, I work in the open source side, so I'm not going here to sell you anything. And in fact, I'm not even going to talk about Nginx for this. Um, three other interesting facts. Everybody's a million points of data. One, I'm owned by four cats. I am used to being ignored. Two, I'm married. I have proof. I do not read minds. And three, I spent 10 years as a soccer ref. I'm used to people disagreeing with me. In fact, at any given call, I expect half of you to disagree with anything I say. So with that, let's, let's get started going through this. So I'm going to talk about observability. And I need to set up this little thing before we get to tracing. Observability is a data problem. We started off today talking about some of the data engineering things. And some of that is going to get brought out a little bit clearer inside of this as well. But the reason we deal with this is that the more information, the more observable a system is, the faster we can figure out what the heck has gone wrong. And that becomes really important when we're looking at today's world. And that's because we have all sorts of data coming in. These are the observability signals um, that are here, metrics, traces, and logs, or otherwise known, do I have a problem? Where is the problem? What is the problem? Or what does the application think is the problem? And we have this conflict, which isn't really a conflict, between what we think of as monitoring and observability. They're actually joint partners. Observability provides data. Monitoring lets us see what the data is telling us. Data is useless without analysis and visualization. And this lets us know what's going on inside the system. This lets us know what's going on inside of those pipes, inside of the application, inside of the spaces here. And it basically is designed to help reduce what's known as mean time to clue. In other words, what the heck went wrong? and in turn, reducing mean time to resolution. And when we have monoliths, nobody cares because our pathways are fixed. They're always set. But when we get into microservices, where things are today, our pathways are no longer fixed. We have lots of little services that are loosely coupled, independent, may not even be the same languages, can be written by multiple teams all over the place, get updated on their own schedules, and that means that we have all of these pieces that we have to be able to test independently, configure independently, and deploy independently. What happens is that in a cloud environment in particular, problems do not repeat. If you are in a Kubernetes environment, and when you refire it up, you do not necessarily have the same resources. You may not have the same data pathways. And so we now need data that's telling us all this stuff, interconnections, as well as the application services, how they're going. So that when something goes wrong that we didn't expect, we can go back and figure out what that means. And especially in this cloud environment, this is known as the Knieven framework here. This is a demonstration why in mathematics they say you only change one variable at a time. Well, with microservices and clouds, we actually changed two things. Microservices added a level of complexity. Things became a lot more complicated. A lot of services, a lot of loosely coupled environments, the things we talked about. When we go into cloud, we have a chaotic environment. We don't know where things are. We can ask, but at the same point in time, we have elastic and ephemeral behavior. So we now have serverless functionalities. We have the ability to expand and contract services. We have all these pieces moving and we've changed them both at the same time. And so this is why observability is now come into being and why we're really interested into it. And the heart of observability has really been around distributed tracing. And so what do we need this distributed tracing for? Well, distributed tracing gives us some unique things. Every request is guaranteed to have a unique independent ID to it. So every single request Every single user, every single application can be tracked through the entire system from start to finish. We also have this thing that's called autopropagation. When it passes from service to service, that information passes with it. So we don't have to regenerate things. And so we don't have to worry about collisions of namespaces in tracing environments. And 
it's completely distributed capable. Right now, I would hardly I suggest you run this in a multi-cloud tracing environment. The data ingress will kill you for that. But none of those things all sort of come together so that we can now do things like make sure that we have all the pieces necessary. And to make that happen, we needed standards-based agents, we needed cloud integration, we needed developer frameworks, we needed lots of languages. Basically, we wanted to use any code, anytime, anywhere for this. When this all really kind of caught on was back in about 2010 with this thing called Dapper out of, out of Google. And Dapper begat something called Census, both of which were internal to Google. And that's how we traced the application space inside of that space. That became an open source project called Open Census. At the same point in time, this other thing, open tracing, had come into being and was a open source project under when the CNCF formed in 2015, became part of the CNCF activity space. These two were competing spaces. They defined a way of defining that trace ID and putting pieces together. The difference was open tracing said, you go figure out what you're going to do with it. And open census came back and said, here's some really cool things that you can start doing the analysis with. So we put the two together. Open tracing, open census merged and became what we now call as open telemetry. Open telemetry in this space, observability space, pretty much rules the world. It's not quite the penetration that Kubernetes has, but um, I think I saw in an earlier presentation today, 70% of, of large companies are using open tracing in their application space. And I cannot name a monitoring vendor of any type that's not using open telemetry today. And so when you start looking at those, this became something that became really important for people to understand. And if you remember, I talked about how we really want to do this. Open telemetry users build and own everything that's providing that data collection. No vendor lock-in. 100% open source under Cloud Data and Computing Foundation. Nothing to worry about. Open telemetry worries about the collection. Analysis and visualization is left as an exercise to the, the observability back end. And so, what's it good for? Well, this is a start, and this is something that's known as the red monitoring dashboard, or rate error duration. This is the rate that things are going through, and I think if I remember correctly, this is a 10 second. I've sped it up for this. Um, this is the duration, how long a request is taking to go through the system, and this is my error percent. And if you can tell, every now and then I'm getting some pretty significant errors inside of that. Over on this side, I'm actually looking at um, the strip chart of activity as it comes in on the collection basis. Open telemetry has the ability to do to observing its data in, I've forgotten what it is, but it's defined down to nanoseconds. But we don't collect data that fast because we can't read it that fast. For example, use something like this and try to look at a tail minus F log file. And you ain't gonna keep up with it, not gonna happen. But we do want to show you what's happening. And you can see some pretty period, standard period things that are happening. But when we do this, we want to, to start figuring out a couple of things. Remember, tracing tells us where something has gone wrong. And so when I'm seeing these pieces, I can see that all of a sudden my error rate has gone up in here. But it doesn't tell me anything about what's gone wrong. It doesn't show me who went wrong. Because each of these traces in individual are user basis. They are just to that user request. And by the way, users only care about their request, this time, how long it took, and whether it succeeded or failed. And then the next request is exactly the same thing. We, if you're a DevOps or an SRE, which my background is, we care about everybody all together working. They don't care. They care about their request and their request only. So we need to be able to dig down into it. Distributed tracing is that individual user request. This view is a dashboard for the ops teams to be able to say things are going well or things are not going well. And so the other piece is that it supports different models. And inside of that model, the one I just showed you is red, and red is a back-end model. It's really looking at the application space at the back end. But there are also other things, RUM real user monitoring, which actually takes a single user and tracks him from when the request started in their browser or on their phone all the way through con conclusion. 
this side of that. The synthetics, which is to set up an artificial case of a user so that we can track through it and know what we expect to see each time. And this becomes very useful in our testing environments and our, our environments before we deploy out to know that we haven't changed anything that's going to massively impact what's going on here. NPM, network performance monitoring. How is the network happening, helping across a full application user request here? And then APM, application performance monitoring, and then also the infrastructure. Despite what the cloud people will tell you, there's still hardware somewhere running this system. And so we still need to know what the infrastructure impact is gonna be inside of that. Now, as an example, again, in a Kubernetes space, um, have somebody forget to put uh, memory management on the pods in a node and watch what happens if you have a memory leak. Your request may still work, but they'll be ungodly slow. But unless you know what the infrastructure is looking like related to that request, you'll never be able to find what's going on in a noisy neighbor problem. So down here are some other interesting things that this will tell you. You can start looking at top latent services by latency. Who's taking the longest from your application viewpoint? You can start looking at this and say, a business workflow. How is this working through the process or pathway I expected it would be? And all of this is actually made possible from that distributed tracing environment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the tracing aspect itself. So first of all, you have to know these three concepts. Whoops, how did I get too far? Oops, okay, yes, so here we go. So the first one is a span. The span represents a single unit of work. A span does not necessarily represent a single service. A service can have multiple units of work, but a span represents a single service if, a unit of work. If we don't do the right things inside of our service, that service will equal a span because we're gonna look at the start point and the end point. A trace is all the spans together from start to finish in chronological order for that. And then we have what's called distributed context. Distributed context is everything else that goes along with it. The tracing identifiers, the tags that you may want to put on there about what and where it's coming from, um, options that you may want to go into to this, semantic conventions come into play here. So if, for instance, if you have a trace and you really want to know what it's running on, you may want to put in um, a, an option that makes sure that you carry it forward. If you've got log files, you may want to put in something that says, put the trace ID with the log when it gets written out. And so those things automatically happen. And when we look at it, this is one of the two major views of a trace that you will see. This is called a directlic, directed acyclic graph. And what it's actually showing you is how the process comes in and where it goes for each piece. And in this case, it's actually telling me how long it took in transport between those two services. And so you can see, for instance, where things are going. And depending on the analysis tool, for instance, you can see that there may be um, a color associated with it. The size of the circle may mean something. But there are lots of different things that are happening. So you have a request path. This is the pathway. You have the service that it's running on. You have the microservices duration and then you have the connection duration. All that comes from that single trace. So as it goes through, you may see more and more of these things. Now there's a nice feature when we look at distributed tracing because we have third party applications. They're not instrumented, but we can still represent that their calls come out here. We just can't give you a lot of information about what went on inside of it. And so the trace literally is where the request went all the way through. And we can also start looking at things like user request, <laughs> user request capabilities, um, and continue to look at how that data falls in place. This is the other way that you will most often see traces represented. And this is, a, one of a better term, a waterfall plot. And this is showing you a single trace in the services by duration. And again, coloring may or may not mean anything, but you could start by saying, okay, my trace took this length of time. And its first call went to this thing, which then called and did other units of work. Likewise, same thing. After this finished, 
This one got called and it did issue this to work. This is showing a synchronous pathway. One that gets called until the other one. It does not need to be synchronous. It can be asynchronous, but you'll get some really kind of funky looking trace waterfall plots that happen that way. And again, it'll give you the microservices duration and it will give you the overall trace duration. And in general, you can, for instance, see that this one and this one add up almost, but not quite to the service, to the two pieces. And that's because of connection delays. And so there's a two microsecond delay inside of this for those pieces. Over here, you can actually see what was loaded, what the pieces were that match up to those services. And so you'll see both of these approaches. One is really good for looking through and saying, my requests are flowing through fine. This one, on the other hand, has the ability to attach other unique pieces of data to it. Click on a span, take a look at the underlying resources, take a look at what hardware it's running on, take a look at what AWS cloud it may be running in. And all those pieces become really important when you're going forward. And that's this baggage concept. And you'll hear it as baggage, you'll hear it as resources. They basically are meaning the same thing. And in this case, I can click on a service and I can see that it, what the container was, where the container was, what the HTT methods were, all the way down, all the way through. And so all of a sudden I've got all the information I need to know exactly what was going on, where it was going on, and what was happening. And by attaching this to the other pieces of information around metrics, around logging, all of a sudden I can start looking and saying, this is what has happened. So this becomes a really interesting um, choice when we start looking at that. Now, distributed tracing is complex. It's semi-chaotic because each of these tracing is language dependent to a point. So there are SDKs and APIs that match in here. But we have some pretty significant things that we wanted to make sure happened here. One was that it didn't affect the quality of service of an application here. We also wanted to support all the major languages, and there's a list of them. You can go out to opentelemetry.io and see it. We wanted to use this thing called the Hotel Collector, which is the um, secret Swiss army knife inside of any distributed tracing. Collect whatever you want, push it out as whatever you want, do stuff in the middle with it, with as low an overhead as possible. And the last thing we kind of always needed to be able to do was instrument the applications. So we have language dependencies, framework dependencies, services in here going into a collector, which can then feed into an aggregator collector and, for instance, shift off to Jaeger or a commercial project, whatever you want. We use Jaeger a lot with Nginx when we're looking at our open telemetry stuff. It's just, it's easy, it works, we know what we're dealing with. So, I'm not going to go a lot through the architecture, but these are the moving pieces that we're working with inside of here. They really break down with an API, the piece that ethically does the work, the SDK piece, and then the collector piece. And these are really the only three things that kind of really make up open telemetry. There's lots of moving parts inside of this, uh, there are lots of different statuses inside of this, and this is a three and a half hour workshop by itself, so I'm not going to do it for that. So, what do you have to do? Well, when you're actually implementing this, you have two basic options. One, you can do what's called traffic inspection, which is how is this being propagated among my services? If you've ever worked with a service mesh, nearly every service mesh does traffic instrumentation for you. And you can just roll it out, throw it into your um, hotel and now analyze and visualization, and you will get amazingly cool information about how long a request took. The other one is code instrumentation with context. And code instrumentation says, now I'm gonna take the code and put in the pieces so I know what's happening inside those units of work inside that application. Context basically saying, and this is where it's working for that. So when we focus on code, we basically are gonna add a context library dependency. We're going to focus, first of all, on service-to-service -service communication for this, and then we're going to make the spans better. Everything is not quite lowest common denominator, but everything is common because we don't want any capable of lock-in to happen inside of that. And then we can add anything else we want to at the same point in time. There are people who have really instrumented this. And while I talked about the three signals, 
there are as many signals as you care to think of. Um, you could do code profiling, you can do P tracing, you can do all sorts of things and bring them as a signals as well. When we look at this, we have an API, we have an SDK, and we have a collector. Remember back to that architecture. The API is the trace provider. It's what is called to set up the trace ID. And basically, its job is to make sure that we don't have trace IDs collide for that. The tracer is the thing that builds the spans. It has a trace ID, and then it creates a span ID. Span IDs are not guaranteed to be unique. I don't think I've ever run into two that collided, but that's not to say that it can't happen. But when you put a trace ID and a span ID together, they are unique because the trace ID is always unique. And the span is what actually traces the work, the operation that goes through. So we talk a lot about this, and this is something that came out in this morning's keynote again around data. Data can be represented in many ways. But we can know that there are some common things that happen anytime we're touching a computing system, an application, be it third party or first party. And so we have this list of semantic conventions that we all got together agreed that says, if you have an HTTP call, it's gonna be tagged HTTP, and it's gonna have a dot subclass. And those are semantic conventions which are always there. You don't have to do anything. When it recognizes it, it will tag it with those conventions. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. This is not a complete list uh, by any stretch uh, for this. And their job is really to make sure that we all the attributions get unified. So all things that are alike actually get pulled as likes for that. There are also library-specific ones. I pulled the AWS ones uh, here. But there are others that are out there that are conventions that are specific to environments. We also have what are called contribs. We have core as well as the user contribs. Cores are maintained by the people who are building the, the, the specifications and the code. Contribs, the other contribs are built by companies. And so for instance, if you want a Cassandra specific library, it's there. Just go look in the, the contrib space. So, now have these things, but we want span events because span events are the things that let us add all that other cool information to this. And it can be the name of the event, it could be a timestamp, everything is timestamped, which can be a problem for here, but it's what information you wanna to add to that span. And that becomes a really important point. And so here's a quick little example from a resource viewpoint. So if I call into a Kubernetes pod, I can see that it came out of the telemetry collector contrib, so it's part that was added into the collector for this. Its namespace is for monitoring. It's an hotel collector, it went through. Um, and then over here, cloud function does the same thing, tells me where the cloud came from, the resource came from, all those pieces. So this gives me the insights to where things are running and how things are running inside of this. And so span examples, resource examples are really very useful. So. Why do you want to trace? Well, we talked a little bit about the cool things, but the first thing it's going to give you is performance information. It's going to tell you how things are working from the user viewpoint. And that means that things like, if your mean time to resolution is too high, um, or detection is too high, mean time to detection is too high, this will help you, because you're going to start seeing things that the users are seeing. Um, and you're not going to have to wait for them to put out on Twitter that, you know, is something running correctly for that. Um, and then metrics and logs are great, but they don't tell you what the user is seeing. And so we need those two pieces. This is the bridge between those. And of course, the more data, the better. By the way, this is a data problem. There's a massive amount of data that comes into play um, in open telemetry. Uh, tracing can easily double the amount of data that you came in here. So when we started looking at this, one of the things that's notable is that it's difficult to correlate all of the behavior with what's being, what's working. And so open telemetry, because it collects all of the signals, lets us start bringing together all those classes of data for that. And because it's all in a format, we're no longer having to do a lot of translation between formats, which can cause their own sets of problems. And so bringing it in as OTLP, the open telemetry line protocol, means that everything can be ma massaged together inside of here. And so that led us to this thing. 
We've been doing this for a long time. The concept of observability actually started with process engineering back in the 1950s. Um, and it was pretty much how fast is the water flowing through the pipe? Or that was kind of the model. And this became, looking at this from a software viewpoint, how fast are things flowing through our new software environments? But what we had was this thing where we collected everything individually and then we were responsible for putting it all together. So we moved from this open telemetry 1.0 to this 2.0 concept. And I have to use the word concept because we're now creating all the things. We're now collecting them all from one point, And we then should be able to do all these things as a unit whole. This is a moving target. The signals, tracing is stable. Metrics, descriptions are stable. Logging is depending on who you talk to, experimental, beta, but not stable. Languages vary. And so, for instance, if you're looking at Java, it's pretty stable even for the logging side. They have solutions. JavaScript has solutions for these things. If you get down to Ruby, um, it's definitely not stable. Uh, if you look at something like the C language, it's definitely not there. And so the mileage may vary in getting to this, even though this is the end state. Probably in the next year, this is where we're all going to be, is being able to put all these pieces together. And so when you're looking at this problem, the first question that you want to ask is, what questions do you ask yourself when you get paged? And can this help you? Generally speaking, we know that something gets broken when you get paged. We want to know what went wrong. We want to know what the users are looking at. We want to know those pieces. The second thing is this is a lot of data. Data equals noise. And so you have to figure out how you want to change that noise question. Do you want to filter it? Do you want to sample it? Or do you want better visualization tools? All three are acceptable functionalities. Then the other piece, the complex environments, microservices, what isn't causing a problem? So almost think of this like a bloom filter approach of saying, this didn't cause the problem. Don't look there. And you get to start looking at what happened. And finally, you get to determine the impact. If you're like, for instance, again, Kubernetes environment with Elastic uh, startup and things got slow, you're probably maybe still serving, but you didn't add new instances in. And so your impact ratio is smaller than something saying the services have just stopped running or the network has stopped running. And so you can quickly determine what your impact looks like. And so this is where it gets a little bit interesting. And I've, I've, I've talked to some of the observability vendors here, and almost everybody does recognize that this is where we need to go. We need to not only standardize trace IDs, but we need to be able to standardize our trace naming structures for the particular environment it's in. Semantic conventions, but user controllable, if you will. We want to output the errors to both the logs and traces. So I want to be able to put the two together. I want a trace ID in my logs, I want a log, I, uh, trace, uh, log ID that can point back to its trace. And so I want to be able to go easily back and forth and not be dependent on timestamps or guesswork for that. One of the things that we did when we were playing around with this was we built a tracing statement inspector. So we could put trace IDs in the comments for SQL. One of the things we feel was not quite there. We wanted to know what request was calling SQL and when it called and what the call was. And so we put it in there. And then we built one for Nginx and Apache, and it's out on GitHub. Um, so grab it, make use with it. If I remember correctly, it's Java um, code. So you know that's, your mileage may vary there as well. But what we found was this all of a sudden let us start looking at the problems that were underlying the surface of these third-party applications while still being able to request it back to a specific user. And so. Span for everything, well, remember what you want to trace. How much you want to trace makes a difference here. Start with your service boundaries or your third party boundaries. Don't try to instrument everything. You will not be happy. And then make it iterative. Go in and remove things that you find you don't need. Add things that you may find that you need. Because there is definitely an information overload that can happen. Um, and it's very easy to get into that information overload. Um, I mentioned dealing with the noise. And I wanted to cover this one fairly quickly here, because most of the time you hear this as a sampling approach. And 
In open telemetry, there are two major samplings that are kind of built in. One's called head-based and one's called tail-based. And head-based is, oh, a trace started, do I want to save this or not? It's purely random. So if you save 10 out of 100 traces, you've thrown away 90 of the traces, you have no idea whether they are good or bad before you've decided to save them. Tail-based, which is actually called sampling, it's not, it's really filtering, waits till the trace is completed, looks to see if it meets certain conditions, and then says, save it. Both are useful, and both of them are not necessarily complete. So getting started, instrument your apps, Get the pieces you want out of it. You may not want all three. That's up to you. You can use automatic instrumentation. You can add in libraries that automatically pull your application and instrument it. Your mileage will vary. We did this with our open source code and promptly found that we got lots of data and no meaning. And so we went through and trimmed the heck out of it for this. We manually instrumented some of our code because you can do both at the same time. Basically, you go in and tell the code when you want a specific set of traces to be done. And then, <clears throat> shorthand, you add the appropriate files for the automatic side. It is language dependent. Not all languages have automatic. If it's manual, you pull the API SDK in. You configure the API. You configure the SDK. Create your traces. Create your metrics. Export your data. Piece of cake, really. <clears throat> and now, to sum up, I always sum up with this sort of bottom line. And this is actually from 1979, Brian Kernighan, um, talking Unix for beginners. The most effective debugging tool is still careful thought, coupled with judiciously placed print statements. Observability is our new print statement. And distributed tracing is a new granular form of this, this print statement that gives us more information than we've ever had before. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. That's my LinkedIn. Um, and my timer went off, so.